Alright, number 15. 15 is saturation. Um, category analysis offers no new content. Um, that's, that's pretty uh, straightforward. We recognize that uh, a category has become saturated when in, in analyzing the data for the category. I recognize that I'm not getting any new information, right? Everything that, um, all new information, all new content information for the category that I'm getting um, is becoming redundant. I already have those concepts built into the category. So, I mean, what does that look like? Um, I'm just going to conceptualize like this. Imagine that we're talking about category X. And category X is a composition of concept A, concept B, concept C, concept D. So this is my category. And these are my concepts. All right. So this is my category. These are my concepts. Category X is a um, composition of concept A, B, C, D. Um, I feel for whatever reason, for whatever reason, that I'm missing something. There might be E. I feel like there might be E in this category. E might. I might need to get this information. So what I do is, here's the population. I go into the population and I interview a participant, right? and I interview, let's say, many participants, but all the information that I get from the participants, this participant tells me C, this participant tells me D, this participant tells me A, um, this participant tells me B, right? There becomes redundancies in the information, um, because as a consequence of theoretical sampling, I'm not getting any new information, I'm already getting what I have then we say that this category is now saturated. Right? The, the category is saturated because um, all new content information isn't additional. No, there is no new content information. There is no new content information to be had. Um, when I go and I theoretically sample within the population, the data that I get back already reinforces existing data. And then we say that the, uh, the, the category has become saturated and we leave the category alone. Saturation is a good thing. Right? You want your category to get to the point of saturation because what's that, what, what that is letting you know as a researcher is a number of things. One, that the, con the, the content based on the concepts of the categories is, is not necessarily nearly complete, uh, completely or, or complete because you, know, you don't want to say that this is an exhaustive set of concepts. That would be, that would be sort of fallacious. Um, but you would say that there's enough information in the category to be able to do whatever theorizing you need to do. So that's the first advantage, is that you know we've sort of closed the analysis of that category. Whether it becomes a main category or a subordinate category, um, you won't know until after selective coding. But what we recognize in, um, in, in categories that the second benefit is, is that the fact that you've gone back into the community, you've done some theoretical sampling, and all of the data that you're getting reinforces data that you already have, shows you that the data that you already have is good data. It's being validated um, multiple times with new participants, right? The, the data is itself being validated. Um, you know, having interviewed 50, let's say having interviewed um, 2,000 people, I interviewed an additional 50, and the new content information, and then I didn't receive any new content information from the new 50 that I didn't already have from my first set. That lets me know that the content that I have in my first set is pretty solid. It's, it's been substantiated by the uh, interviewing of additional participants. So the good thing about um, saturation is that saturation, it closes sort of the investigation into further content information for the categories as one thing. And the second advantage, and I think I'm losing my voice, <clears throat> the second advantage for, um, for the analysis is that not only does it close sort of my analysis of the category, it validates the concepts that buttress the category. So that's that's also uh, a huge huge benefit. Okay. The the next thing that um, that's important to recognize is the process of sampling, right? Now, again, there's a lot of information that could be covered in, um, in grounded theory. I'm not intending for my video series on any of these um, sort of introductory accounts of qualitative methods research 
to serve as a definitive account, right? This is merely a supplement to whatever reading, whatever classes, whatever you already know, right? This is this is only sort of my interpretive account of the functions and the, the various nuances of the six different methods into qualitative research. Within grounded theory, um, sampling is very, very important. And the reason why sampling is very important in, in grounded theory is precisely because of the nature of the theory, right? The theory, um, or the method, as an approach to qualitative research, assumes that the theory, the theory is a consequence, right? Is a consequence of what exists prior. And what exists prior is the data. How do we get the data? Well, there is this process of sampling. So, um, as I said before, I've provided a link in the previous, uh, in the previous section um, to Grandma Gibbs' analysis on YouTube, um, right under 4.1, just click that link. Um, Gibbs has a, a very good uh, intro-friendly account of um, coding and sampling. I'm not sure if he went into sampling, but I know he has coding. I, I saw his coding videos, and I saw his sort of like intro kind of theory video, and they're very good. Um, and then also, you know, uh, supplement the videos with not only the notes, but with some text. Um, so I'm going to give you a very sort of general account of uh, the function of sampling in grounded theory. Right. Alright, so the first thing to recognize um, in sampling, we've already discussed this, is theoretical. And I've talked about theoretical sampling. In theoretical sampling, um, the, the concept, and I don't want to you know, uh, beat a dead horse, but the, the concept in theoretical sampling is that there is missing content information in my data. There's something in my data that I'm, that I'm lacking. And what I need to do is I need to sample a segment of the population because I believe that the information or the data that I collect from the segment of the population is going to fill in the void that exists currently in my theoretical model. I go out and I select on that basis. The selection on that basis is defined as theoretical sampling, right? So theoretical, and I, in the previous videos I went through a bit more detail, I'm not going to go through it again, I gave you the three steps required to successfully theoretical sample. Just find, I don't know which of the videos it was, it might have been like 40 or 41 or something, but in uh, one of those videos, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I discussed the various steps of theoretical sampling. Uh, just go back and watch that. So theoretical sampling the whole idea is that the selection of participants, the selection of um, content information comes as a recognition that there is a lacuna within my data. Based on that content information, I use it to strengthen that lacuna and, and ultimately fill the void that is uh, currently existing. All right. Number two is proven theoretical relevance. Proven. Um, proven theoretical relevance. The significance of concepts because of the reoccurrence and importance, right? The significance of a concept because of the concept's reoccurrence and importance, right? So, uh, proven theoretical relevance, it's important to recognize um, the idea, the incorporation of a concept, right? Which you have to start, um, and you know, it takes a, a few, maybe not even a few years, but you know, a, a good solid semester of practice before you get this under your belt. But as soon as you hear concepts, you know concepts are related to categories. You know that categories um, have properties and dementia as can characteristics. So in a sense, uh, um, concepts are related to all of that. Concepts are related to properties. Concepts are related to dementia. Um, dimension concepts are obviously related to categories. Um, the relevance of a category, so for example, uh, not a category, a concept. So if we're talking about category uh, X, and concept A, concept A is uh, a phenomenon of category X. And when I go through sampling members of the population, the most frequent concept that I get in relation to category X is A. Right? Yeah, I get B and I get C and I get D. But overwhelmingly, right, what I'm hearing and what I'm locating in the data is that concept A is a factor of category X. Oh, concept A, concept A. Everybody's saying this. Like, multiple people are saying it. They're, you know, I'll have someone who says B and C and D, but overwhelmingly what I'm hearing is concept A 
then it has proven theoretical relevance. In understanding category X, concept A has proven theoretical relevance because of the redundancy of concept A in um, sort of assessing my data. Right? It, it's not coincidental. I mean, as theorists, we don't believe in coincidence. Almost there is a theory of coincidence, but which is interesting and a side note. But um, um, uh, I just that threw me off. <laughs> a theory of coincidence that would be interesting. Anyway, um, the redundancy of um, A concept A as a facet of category X isn't coincidental, right? It's there because it has proven theoretical relevance. Um, it's not coincidental that you know multiple participants have said concept A in um, in sort of a articulation of category X in response to whatever the questions are that you might be asking them or the surveys that you might be taking or whatever it might be. Um, the fact that concept A, this is a concept, the fact that concept A is uh, sort of evoked every time uh, in a discussion of category X has it's stated and means that it has proven theoretical relevance. It is, concept A is relevant to category X. So for example, the idea of, um, I don't know, let's say violence is relevant to a discussion of abuse. That's probably a bad example, but you get the idea. It's sort of impossible to talk about abuse without also talking about some form of violence. Now, um, there's, there's a necessary, um, an inextricable almost relationship between the two. All right, so you get the idea. Um, number three.